الحمد لله من الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I bear witness that our Lord is our Creator and Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم peace be upon him is his messenger that he came to deliver a message and he gave it in a perfect way in the way of love and purity. In Western Arabia, shortly after the beginning of the 7th century, a religious movement was born that would change the history of the world. Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the prophet of the one God, Allah, summoned his fellow Arabs to a new way of life that he called Islam. At first, the movement developed slowly. But within a little more than 20 years, it encompassed all of Arabia. After Muhammad's death, his followers quickly spread over the surrounding region. They laid the foundations of a great empire. Between the 9th and 12th centuries, the empire was one of the most brilliant the world has seen. Islam is an Arabic word that comes from a root word meaning peace, soundness or security. Although the word Islam is sometimes used in other senses, fundamentally it is a religious expression that refers to the state of the soul. It signifies an inner attitude of unequivocal obedience to God. The word Islam itself may be translated as surrender, submission or resignation. So Islam is submission or resignation to the will of God, as God's will was communicated to the Prophet Muhammad in a series of divine revelations. Those who observe Islam are called Muslims, literally meaning submitters. Therefore to say I am a Muslim with full awareness is not only an act of identifying with a religious group, it is to say I have committed myself unreservedly to obey the will of God. It implies the constantly renewed, always fresh determination to place every activity of life into the hands of God. Beyond any doubt, this is a profoundly religious declaration. Precise figures are hard to obtain, but today Muslims make up approximately one-fifth of the Earth's population. Islam is second in size only to Christianity, a remarkable achievement for the youngest of the world's major faiths. Muslims are concentrated in the belt of countries on either side of the equator, stretching from Morocco in North Africa to the Philippines in Southeast Asia. The greatest number of Muslims is found in the Indian subcontinent, that is, in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. However, the single nation with the most Muslims is the island republic of Indonesia, where more than 100 million people, over 90% of the population, profess the Islamic faith. It's customary to speak of the Middle East, especially the Arab states and Iran, as the heartlands of Islam. The early history of the Islamic community took place there, and today most people of the region are Muslims. But in the 20th century, the vast majority of Muslims have lived in South and Southeast Asia, in or to the east of Pakistan. Islam also has recently become a significant presence in Western Europe and in America. Islam today is very much alive. It is a powerful force in our world. One of the foremost obligations of every believing Muslim is to bear witness to his faith. This he must do by repeating the shahada or witnessing formula. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no deity but that of Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Muslims worship God, not the Prophet Muhammad. It is a gross error, therefore, to speak of the Islamic religion as Muhammadanism or to refer to its followers as Muhammadans. Muhammad's role in Islamic belief is very different from that of Jesus in Christianity. Muhammad is viewed as a prophet or messenger of God, while Christians consider Jesus 
to be the incarnation of the deity itself. Little is known about the early life of Muhammad, not even the precise date of his birth. Though available information is sparse, we do know that Muhammad was born around 570 CE into one of the poorer families of Makkah, called Mecca in English. Muhammad's livelihood depended upon trade. He traveled with caravans to some of the areas bordering Arabia. Muhammad's call to prophecy occurred when he was about 40 years old. He was a reflective man who cultivated the habit of meditation, solitary vigils, and fasting in the hills surrounding Makkah. He began to preach after he received a revelation as described in a chapter of the Quran entitled The Cloaked One. The first verses read, O thou enveloped in thy cloak, arise and warn, thy Lord magnify, thy raiment purify. Traditions say that when Muhammad received the revelations, he became oblivious to his surroundings, falling into a trance-like state. According to Islamic orthodoxy, God was the author of the revelations. Muhammad received them, and the intermediary between the two was an angel, traditionally identified as Gabriel. The pagan Arabs of Muhammad's day knew and appeased a variety of powers. Evidence in the Quran and in the poetry of the pre-Islamic Arabs shows that these Arabs knew of a high god they called Allah, but they did not worship him. It should be noted the word Allah is not the name of a god, but simply the Arabic word meaning God. So Muhammad and the revelations were not proclaiming the existence of a new deity unknown to the Arabs. Their purpose was to assert that Allah is the unique and single deity. When Muhammad began his public mission, he at first met with little success. The number of converts was small. Among them were none of the prominent men of Mecca. Several aspects of Muhammad's teachings particularly irritated the Meccans. He scorned their gods. More important, to accept Muhammad's claims to be a messenger of God would also be to accept him as ruler of Mecca something the city's rich merchant oligarchy was decidedly unwilling to do. There he encountered very, very serious opposition, even from his own family and tribe, who derived their power from the fact that there were idols in the Kaaba, the, that primordial temple built by Abraham on the basis of what we believe was built by Adam when God first created man. Uh, and therefore, the mission of Islam, which was that of divine unity and opposition to all idolatry, struck at the very foundations, really, of the power of the family, of the Quraysh tribe, which was the tribe of the Prophet himself. In 621, Muhammad began negotiating with some citizens of Yathrib, an oasis about 100 miles north of Mecca. About 70 followers soon moved to Yathrib, and a year later, Muhammad followed. The emigration from Mecca to Yathrib is known as the Hijra. The city of Yathrib was later called Medina Tun Nebi, which means the city of the Prophet, or simply Al Madina, the city. This emigration marked a radical turn in the Prophet's life. His teachings now were put into communal practice. The date of the Hijra also is the beginning date of the Islamic calendar, which is based on the cycles of the moon. Once he was firmly established in Medina, Muhammad turned his attention. Once he was firmly established in Medina, Muhammad turned his attention to the outside, particularly to dealing with his old enemies, the Makans. Through a series of alliances and military actions, he gained influence among the tribes in the area surrounding Medina. Then he began to intercept the Makan caravans that were the lifeblood of that city. In a small place which is southwest of the present city of Medina called Badr, a small village. Uh, the Meccans brought up a large military force with a caravan. And a battle ensued between a much smaller Muslim army, uh, perhaps 300 men, and a much larger uh, Meccan army. But the Meccan army was defeated very, very soundly 
and many people were killed, a small number of people were killed in the Muslim army, and had the Meccans won, that would have been the end of Islam. Muhammad's power grew until he was able to occupy his native city of Mecca in 630 without a fight. He treated the city and its inhabitants generously. Makkah's great shrine, the Kaaba, was cleansed of its many gods and polytheistic associations, and it became the center of Muslim religious devotion. With the conquest of Makkah, Muhammad became the most prestigious and powerful man in all Arabia. But in 632, only two years after Makkah was conquered, Muhammad died at about age 62 after a short illness. The Islamic community immediately plunged into controversy over the issue of leadership. It was saved from disintegration when a group of Muhammad's closest companions decided to acclaim the aging Abu Bakr as community head. Abu Bakr was thus the first Khalifa or successor to the Prophet. He and the next three of Muhammad's successors reigned in a succession that is called the rightly guided Caliphate. Muhammad had united the whole of the Arabian Peninsula under his dominion, something never done before. His statesmanship had established the foundations of a brilliant empire whose full glory would be realized over the following four centuries. Muhammad's greatest contribution, however, was the religious teaching that lay at the basis of all else. It amounted to an entirely new worldview, and from it has come one of history's richest and most dynamic spiritual traditions. For Muslims, prophecy is the means by which God has communicated his will and his guidance to mankind throughout the ages. Islamic tradition variously says that 8,000, 124,000, and even 240,000 prophets have appeared in history. Islam recognizes some of the prophets mentioned in the Bible, such as Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. Muslims believe that God sent down many books in the past, some known and others unknown. These include the Torah, referring to the Torah of Moses, the Zabur, or Psalms, of David, and the Injil, Gospel, of Jesus. To these prophets and their books, the Muslims added the name of Muhammad and the book sent through him, the Quran. And the essence of the prophet's heart well, it was so pure that that energy was spreading in Mecca, which is a desert, and reaching the whole world from far east to far west. So that love that came out of the heart of prophet is like the, the queen bee that gave the honey, the energy to the bees to produce honey. The similarity in Jesus, that love in his heart to humanity, it reached everyone. Like Moses, his love reached everyone. Underlying the Islamic doctrine of prophecy is a distinctive understanding of human nature and the human condition. As Muslims understand it, the fundamental problem for all people is our limitation as creatures. We are ignorant of the proper way to live, and we are unable to discover it with our own unaided faculties and resources. For Muslims, the history of mankind might be sketched as a repeated process of receiving guidance through prophecy and then falling away from it. Humans, evidently, have an inherent tendency to turn away from the divine pathway to pursue their own way. Yet Muslims believe that with the advent of Muhammad, the cycle of prophetic messengers reached its climax and end. According to the Quran, he was the seal of the prophets. Islam is a religion of the book. At its very heart is the Quran, the collection of revelations that came to Muhammad, beginning with his call to prophecy and lasting until the end of his life. The Quran is approximately the size of the Christian New Testament. It is divided into 114 surahs or chapters. Very little is known about the condition or status of the Quran when the Prophet died. 
Muhammad had arranged to have at least portions of it written down and organized into chapters. But the Muslim community unanimously agrees that the great work of collecting and publishing the Quran was done in the time of the first three Khalifas, or successors to the Prophet. This is the time when the Quran is said to have been compiled from writings on stones, on the ribs of palm leaves, on scraps of leather, and on the shoulder blades of animals. The Quran also was compiled from the hearts of men, that is, from their memories. Muslims generally agree that the Quran as we know it was compiled under the patronage of the third Khalifa, Uthman. Orthodox Muslims firmly believed that since the day it was compiled, the Uthmanic Quran has been preserved from change, distortion or error, down to the last punctuation mark. Because Muslims have the lively sense that the Quran is the very word of God, they resist translating the holy book. When the Quran is translated, particularly into languages of the Muslim world, such as Persian or Turkish, it is customary to print the Arabic text along with the translation. Everybody can understand the beauty of the text of the Quran. And so the Quranic Arabic has remained uh, the criterion for perfect Arabic, the supreme model of the Arabic language ever since the Quran was revealed. And therefore, throughout the vast regions of the Islamic world, for a billion, two hundred million Muslims, there is no one who does not appreciate the beauty of the Arabic language of the Quran, even if they cannot understand the words. Muslims accord extreme care and reverence to the Quran. It is never placed on the ground, and it is never allowed to touch an unclean substance. Reverence for the Quran also led to embellishment of the text through a refined and beautiful calligraphy an art form that exalts the scripture in a direct way. The Quran describes God as having a number of attributes, including knowledge, power, life, hearing, sight, will, etc. A list of 99 such qualities, called the 99 most beautiful names, has been compiled from the Quran. They have played an important role in Islamic mystical thinking and in Islamic theology as well. Muslims hold that the earthly Quran is drawn from a heavenly book, which has been eternally with God and which contains the speech of God. This heavenly book is mentioned in the passages of the Quran itself, where it is variously called the mother of the book, a well-guarded tablet, or a concealed tablet that only the pure may touch. The revelations sent down to the previous prophets, like those sent down to Muhammad, are all thought to be taken from this heavenly book. Since the Quran is regarded as God's speech, every aspect of it is sacred. This includes not only what it says, but even the very sound of the words. The word Quran means something to be read or recited. One should not take up the Quran or recite its verses except in a state of ritual purity and with serious intentions. To touch, read or recite the Quran or to hear it recited is to stand in the presence of the divine. Great attention is also devoted to reciting the Quran in a proper way. In the revelations, the prophet was commanded to recite it recitingly, that is, to recite the revelation in a beautiful and compelling manner. Veneration of the Quran is shown in other ways as well. All over the Islamic world, Muslims seek to commit the whole Quran to memory, even though it is a book of about 6,200 verses and some 120,000 words. To take the Quran into one's memory is a devotional act of great words. To take the Quran into one's memory is a devotional act of great merit. It is, in effect, to absorb the Quran into oneself, making the divine word a part of oneself. For these reasons, there are schools throughout the Islamic world for teaching the text of the Quran to children. The Quran is the fundamental authority for Muslims in all matters of religion and law. It touches every aspect of Islamic life. Muslims seek to combine their religious ideals with political governance. 
In certain Muslim countries, the Quran itself is considered to be the constitution of the state. Muslims are vitally interested to know exactly how they should behave in the various circumstances of life. Islamic law is nothing less than the effort to set out Allah's will for human conduct. The divinely ordained pattern for a righteous human life is called Sharia, a word that means a well-trodden path, a broad highway, or the pathway to water. Because of the Sharia's broad scope, it is often said that Islam is a complete system of life. It regulates ritual behavior, supplies rules for personal hygiene, stipulates proper clothing. If you want to give explanations as they're given in the Quran as to why someone should wear a scarf, the explanation is given that you should wear it so that you're known as a Muslim and not molested and that you should wear it when you go out. Our organization, though, doesn't emphasize wearing a scarf, and in fact, we don't even discuss it when we have conferences and meetings because um, we consider that something that's a personal choice between a woman and God, and her choice of covering is her own choice. No one should force her to cover, and no one should force her to uncover. Because of its broad scope, the Sharia might better be called a moral code than a law, and governs even what might be considered manners or etiquette. So you have to tolerate people, to be patient with people, to be a loving person, to love everyone, no discrimi discrimination, no racism, no bad manners, no bad characters, and what you apply and teach others, you must apply it first to yourself. Islamic law classifies human acts into five categories. In the central position is a great mass of activity that is morally neutral. Acts in this category are neither commanded nor disallowed. They are simply permissible. Other acts are recommended but are not compulsory. A third category describes mandatory acts such as ritual prayer or payment of alms. On the negative side there is a category of acts that are disapproved, yet permitted. According to a tradition of the Prophet, the most detestable of these disapproved acts is divorce. Though ironically, divorce is relatively easy to achieve under Islamic law. A fifth category of acts is entirely forbidden, such as drinking wine or eating pork. Unlike Western legal traditions, Islamic law is based on scripture, in modern Western countries, law is preeminently the concern of the state, and there are territorial limits to its jurisdiction. By contrast, the Sharia binds the individual Muslim without involving the state in many areas, and it has no territorial limits. There is no Muslim ecclesiastical structure or body of people with the authority to define dogma. For Muslims, the agreement of the community is one of the sources of law. Muslims are bound by the divine will wherever they may be, though there are different obligations under Muslim rulers than under non-Muslim rulers. Every Muslim has essential obligations to God. The most important of these obligations to God are the five pillars of Islam, the profession of faith, prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage. Every Muslim must profess his faith by reciting the Shahada, a brief yet precise witnessing formula. I bear witness that our Lord is our Creator and Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him is his messenger that he came to deliver a message and he gave it in a perfect way in the way of love and purity every new convert to Islam must profess his faith in the presence of witnesses and the profession is repeated many times daily in the ritual prayers prayer is the second pillar the Islamic prayer is performed five times daily. 
before sunrise, at noon, in the afternoon, sunset, and at nightfall. Prayer may be performed in any clean place, either privately or in the company of others. Times for prayers are marked by the call of a muezzin from the minaret of a mosque. These hauntingly beautiful calls are familiar to every traveler in the eastern lands. Before undertaking the prayer, the worshipper must be in a state of ritual purity. Preparations for prayers include ablutions and the intent to pray. In every mosque, there is running water, and a place is set aside for ablutions. Congregational prayer is performed every Friday at noon, and also on feast days in the mosque. Prayer is always offered in the direction of Makkah, and its great shrine, the Kaaba. Almsgiving, the third of the Islamic pillars, is a kind of Islamic welfare system. The law prescribes specific amounts that are to be given from each of several different types of wealth that the Muslim may possess. This money may be given to the poor and the needy, to debtors, to the wayfarer, or generally to be spent in the way of God, as the Quran expresses it. Ramadan, the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar, is a time for fasting the fourth pillar of Islamic practice. Fasting begins each morning, as soon as there is enough light to distinguish a white thread from a black one. During daylight hours, the Muslim must refrain from food or drink of any kind. After sunset, the fast is broken by a simple meal. Since the Muslim lunar year is only 359 days long, over time, the month of Ramadan rotates through the seasons. The fasting period ends with one of the major religious festivals of the Islamic year, the Eid ul Fitr, which celebrates the breaking of the fast. During the festival, it is customary to wear new clothing, to visit friends, and to give gifts. The fifth pillar of Islam is the pilgrimage to Mecca, called the Hajj. Every able-bodied and financially competent Muslim should make the pilgrimage at least once in a lifetime, and one who has done so is known as a Hajji. On entering the sacred precincts of Mecca, a pilgrim must undergo ritual purification, and this includes donning a special garment. First of all, when you go there, the men and the women have to dress in white and very simply. The men wear two pieces of cloth, uh, take all of their jewelry, anything else off, and so do the women. So one is reduced, in a sense, to a kind of purity and equality before God, like in the Day of Judgment. Whether you're a king or you're a beggar, when you make the pilgrimage, there's no distinction. Absolutely no distinction, cannot tell. And in fact, the white cloth that is worn is usually sewn together, used as a shroud when one dies. Just to give you one vignette, I saw in front of me when I was making the circle, the circumambulation of the Kaaba, which you do counterclockwise, which um, uh, uh, implies and, and establishes that um, time and space are of no consequence because you're going counterclockwise. You're in indicating that time is only created. It's not real. And um, I saw two old created, it's not real. And um, I saw two old men, they must have been about 90 years old each, walking really, really slowly, holding hands, and it looked like they must have been friends forever. And they were doing their circles, you know, and oblivious to the rest of the world. You know, it probably took them about eight hours to do the same thing that I did in about, you know, two and a half hours. And it was beautiful. It's like time had stopped for them. They were taking their time, doing their walk. And the only thing that mattered to them 
was that they were doing something religious, fulfilling that before they died, and they were together. This happens in one of the lunar months of the 12-month lunar calendar of Islam, which is called the month of uh, pilgrimage, and there's very elaborate rituals connected with it. Certain movements and uh, sacrifice, uh, which represents the sacrifice of an animal. Food is given to the poor. It symbolizes, in fact, the sacrifice of our own passionate soul before God. Muslims everywhere make a sacrifice at this time called the Festival of Sacrifice. And it is among the most significant of the several religious celebrations that punctuate the Islamic year. The climactic event is to stand in the presence of God on the plain of Arafat, the place where the Prophet preached his farewell sermon. After completing the rituals in Mecca, most pilgrims crown their journey to Arabia with a visit to the tomb of the beloved Prophet in Madina. The pilgrimage overall is much more than an act of individual piety. In the older days, it would bring people from all over the world together in one place. And today, that number has increased to 1,200,000 the, uh, the last time the Hajj was held. And so you have people all the way from Toledo, Ohio, to Timbuktu in Mali, to Aceh in Indonesia, to uh, all the way from blondes to uh, dark-skinned people, to Malay-looking uh, people, to Chinese people, to Caucasian, all over, from all over the world. People come, and it's really a unique institution to see it as a, a remarkable experience. Between the 8th and the 12th centuries CE, a tendency towards mysticism appeared among the Muslims. From modest beginnings, this mystical movement rapidly grew to the religious horizon. <laughs> Mystics in every religious tradition say that they are concerned with something ineffable that cannot be properly conveyed in words. Such a feeling can only be experienced. Islamic mysticism usually is called Sufism. You worship God as if you are seeing him. If you are not seeing him, he is seeing you. So that is the where it comes uh, Sufism, and in Arabic we say tasawwuf, means the purity of the heart. And tasawwuf in Arabic means very crystal, like water, very transparent. There are many mystical elements in the Islamic tradition that have contributed to the rise of Sufism. Some are found in the life of the Prophet himself. Muhammad cultivated the habits of fasting, meditation, and prayer in his night vigils, and he lived a life of strict discipline. The Quran is also rich in elements that invite a mystical interpretation, even upon first reading. One verse emphasizes the pervasive divine presence, a basic tenet of mysticism. Remember God always. Sufi mystical orders have a form of worship, peculiarly their own, called thikr, which means to remember or to mention. In this ceremony, Sufis repeat the divine name or some other pious formula. The pace of the recitation often accelerates. Methods of breath control are used, just as in other religions.
Many Sufi orders move rhythmically, in time with the chant. One order, the famous whirling dervishes of Turkey, uses a dignified stylized dance, accompanied by music. The Sufi fikr is thus a means of achieving ecstasy. Its purpose is to lift the worshipper out of himself, so that he may be lost in the contemplation of God. Many mystics, ironically, have endeavored to describe the mystical quest and the mysterious way to union with God. Over the centuries, an enormous literature of Sufi writing has been devoted to explaining the mystical path. You will find a lot of Sufi poetry and Sufi books that express the how to purify yourself in your prayers, in your daily prayers, in your fasting. You can fast, but still you can cheat. You can pray, but still you can deceive. You can do anything, you, but still you might lie. But when you reach a state of purity, and you know that God is looking at you, that is what I said, state of excellence, perfection, the last stage, then you cannot cheat. You have to know that God is looking at you. How I am going to pray and uh, entering in, in the divine presence, and I am cheating and lying. So that's where Sufism comes, and it is rooted in most of the narration of the Prophet and in the Holy Quran. Distinctive Sufi brotherhoods emerged during the 12th century. Sufis could be found among all levels of society, including the governing class, the religious elites, and the common people. Each of many hundreds of brotherhoods bears the name of a great Sufi figure. Biographies of the saints are replete with stories showing their dominance over the forces of nature and their penetration into the hidden truths of things. The power associated with a saint does not cease with his death. The Muslim custom is to build elaborate and beautifully decorated tombs for great saints. The faithful then come in droves on pilgrimages to these tombs. Like a living organism, Islam continues to evolve and develop as each generation of Muslims reappropriates the heritage for itself. Even in recent centuries, new sects or offshoots have continued to appear. Minister Louis Farrakhan! I am registering to vote because I intend by the power of Almighty God to turn America upside down and around. Some of these are variations of Islamic belief, and some broke away from the Islamic tradition from which they came. To continue to present the religion of Islam the way he's doing it, it's wrong. That's, just, that's the bottom line, it's wrong. Yet one major division of the Muslim community is especially important. This is the division between those who call themselves Sunnis and those known as Shia. As we've seen, the word Sunni means a person who follows the Sunnah, or well-trodden way. Sunnis speak of themselves as the people of the established way and the community. More than 85% of Muslims in the world are Sunnis, and perhaps for this reason, their version of Islam is sometimes called orthodoxy. There is no disagreement among Sunni and Shia Muslims about the basic doctrines of Islam. All affirm the oneness of God and the uncreatedness of the Quran. The division between Sunni and Shia Muslims originated in the leadership struggles that arose upon Muhammad's death. The word Shia means partisan of, to be party of, and the of is of Ali, the son-in-law and cousin of the Prophet. The question came up, who should be the representative of the Prophet as ruler of the Islamic community after his death. The majority uh, considered Abu Bakr, the venerable friend of the Prophet who was two years older than him and the first adult male to embrace Islam to be the successor. The heads of the community met together and they elected him. Uh, a smaller number, a minority believed that uh, the Prophet had already designated Ali, who was 12, 13 years old when the Prophet received the message of Islam and also is considered the very first person to have embraced Islam, but also as a young boy. The Shia believe that God will never let the world be without an infallible spiritual guide. 
Just as Muhammad interpreted the revelation to his own generation, they believe an authoritative interpreter and guide is needed for the generations after him. There have been 12 such spiritual guides or imams, and the last of them is said to be still alive in the world, though hidden to the view of humans. Islam teaches that the faithful should reap the rewards of submission to God, both in this world and in the hereafter. But Muslims have found it difficult to reconcile this teaching with what has happened. In the 17th century, the Muslims could claim three great dynastic powers. The Ottoman Empire dominated what is now Turkey and its surrounding regions. The Safavid dynasty governed Persia or what is now Iran and the Mughal Empire reigned in India. All were culturally rich, economically powerful, and militarily strong. By the late 19th century, however, the Mughal Empire had disappeared. It was absorbed into the domains of Britain's Queen Victoria. Iran, the site of the former Safavid dynasty, had been reduced to impotence as rival British and Russian interests competed to control it. And the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. World War I would finish it off. In the 19th century, much of the Islamic world, from Morocco to Indonesia, was reduced to the status of colonies controlled by Western empires. All this has led Muslims to re-examine their fundamental religious convictions as they strive to reform and politically revitalize the Muslim community. Several factors in recent years have combined to reassure Muslims that their feet continue to be upon the straight path. One is the collapse of colonialism, which has allowed Muslim peoples to break the European political yoke. Especially after World War II, one Muslim country after another declared its independence and asserted its nationhood. Muslim states now form a powerful bloc in the United Nations and they enjoy great influence in international affairs. Another factor is the acquisition of great wealth by those Muslim countries with large petroleum resources. They have emerged as major actors upon the world stage. Islam has been growing in part because of the natural increase of populations in the Muslim countries, but there are other factors. One of them is the adaptability of Islamic teaching to local customs and therefore to new regions. Another is Islam's teaching of equality. All are warmly welcomed into the Muslim community, whatever might be their race, social status or background. From this situation has come a renewed awareness of Islam. There has been a strong assertion of its meaning, not only for Muslim populations, but for all people everywhere. Muslims are turning increasingly to the values of their own tradition. In the past, their devotion to Islam seemed to have brought the community to the peak of its power and cultural creativity. Many Muslims believe that if there is to be salvation in the present, it must lie in returning to the sources of that original strength. <laughs>